Hi, I'm talking today with Dr. Michael Lasanti. Uh, Dr. Lasanti is uh, Chair of Translational Medicine and Professor at the University of Salford in the United Kingdom. He, has, he holds uh, MD and PhD degrees from Cornell University in the United States. Um, he's done some very interesting work in aging and especially in cellular, cellular senescence. Um, he has recently written a paper as yet unpublished, which will soon be, I believe, um, on the relation of cellular senescence to COVID-19 infection. So I wanted to talk to him about that. So um, Dr. Lasani, thanks for being here. Glad to be here, Dennis, thank you. Um, so, uh, Michael, um, this, this new paper that you've written is fascinating. Um, you suggest, you, you have done a lot of work on um, the cell biology of cellular senescence and published many papers on, on that topic. And in this current paper, you suggest that uh, cellular senescence may be related to COVID-19 infection. So uh, would you tell us about that? Sure, I'd be sure. delighted. So basically it's a very simple idea. I noticed uh, because uh, obviously COVID-19 is a very hot topic at the moment. Uh, and reading the news, I noticed that uh, there's an association between uh, fatalities in COVID-19 infection and advanced chronological age. And I was just wondering why I mean, it seems like a, such a striking observation and there's really no discussion about the biology. So I began to think about the relationship potentially with senescence. And um, if you look at the cellular markers for the host receptors of COVID-19, they're also related to senescence. So we're talking about uh, two proteins that have been proposed to be the cellular receptor. One is CD26, which is a marker of senescence. The other is uh, ACE2, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Uh, the angiotensin system is also associated with senescence. So you might imagine one idea would be, since these are the host receptors, that people who are older probably have more host receptors. And so that could increase the probability of infection and potentially also uh, these fatalities. So you could potentially explain uh, the lethality of the disease uh, based on senescence. And if that's the case, then uh, if we were to intervene in the process somehow to target the senescent cells and remove them, then potentially you might be able to either prevent the transmission or ameliorate the symptoms uh, and treat the patient more effectively. So the question is, how do you remove uh, senescent cells? There's been a lot of work recently in this area because of the discovery of senolytic drugs, drugs that lyse and remove uh, senescent cells. And many of those drugs have been uh, rediscovered. Uh, many of them are actually existing FDA approved drugs, but they're approved for different indications. And in the United States, for example, 25% of all prescriptions are what they call off-label. So you have a drug for one use, but it's actually uh, prescribed for another. So it's perfectly legal to actually reuse or repurpose a drug uh, for another indication. So uh, for example, there are uh, drugs like azithromycin that we discovered is a, a senolytic drug. It's used mainly for lung infections, but we found that it selectively targets and, and removes effectively 97% of the senescent cells. So I was struck the other day when I saw a clinical trial was published uh, where they looked at COVID-19 viral titer replication and they showed that uh, they used two drugs, actually. One is hydroxychloroquine, also known as Plaquenil, and it is uh, used as an anti-inflammatory, uh, also a, a malarial drug. 
but they showed that uh, it reduced viral titers and also it's used uh, in cell biology to uh, change the pH of the lysosomes, which are very important, and accumulate in senescent cells. So, for example, hydroxychloroquine can uh, reduce the onset of the marker beta-gal, which is a, a well-known marker of senescence. But then they also combined the drug with azithromycin, and they saw that it was even more effective and it brought the viral titers to zero. So, again, azithromycin may be uh, senolytic. So I was intrigued that all of it really fit together. And uh, there's been a lot of talk in the media about the hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, but really no talk about the azithromycin. Unfortunately, in the trial, they didn't do azithromycin alone, but maybe azithromycin alone would be sufficient. So what we're proposing in our perspective article is that people should take a look at this. You know, we don't directly work on COVID-19, but, you know, we have something to add to the pieces of the puzzle to, you know, sort of put it in perspective that maybe there's a link here with aging and senescence and we could capitalize on that. And uh, people talk about vaccines, but that's probably 18 months to two years away. So it'd be nice to have an FDA approved drug that you could use now to prevent or treat the disease while we're waiting for vaccines to becoming uh, available or online. So uh, I think this is a great opportunity actually for the community to put uh, FDA approved drugs such as senolytics into clinical trials and see if they're effective. And uh, since these drugs are already FDA approved and have passed uh, phase one, they're considered to be safe. So there's really nothing to lose by testing these uh, safe drugs in the context of the clinic. I, yes, I'm sure everybody is very interested in anything like that right now, like what you're, you're suggesting. Um, when I have read about the, uh, the age-related severity of COVID-19 infection, um, I have come across um, the fact that, for example, diabetics or people with cardiovascular disease are much more at risk of dying from this illness than others. And um, I maybe assumed, I, I, I suppose that's a good assumption, I assumed that it was the mere fact of being old of, uh, and or of having these underlying diseases. And, and I really can't say that I thought, oh, senescent cells. That wasn't, certainly wasn't the first thing that popped into my mind. Um, wh how would you say, is, is there any way absent uh, year, years of scientific research to differentiate whether it is in fact senescent cells that that are driving this rather than something like say underlying diabetes or is maybe is there such a large overlap between somebody being diabetic for example and having large numbers of senescent cells well i think the consensus in the field is that many aging associated diseases such as diabetes, dementia, cancer, and heart disease, all the underlying cause of all of them is really senescence. So that also fits together surprisingly well that patients with diabetes and heart disease are both more susceptible. In fact, the first clinical study that was published in The Lancet from a, a group in China that described the outcomes the things that were most associated with lethality in COVID-19 infection were advanced age, diabetes, heart disease, and the elevation of the marker IL-6, which is a marker of the SASP, the senescence associated secretory phenotype. So it appears to be from my reading of the literature that what is really uh, killing the patients is this very strong, overwhelming, inflammatory reaction uh, coupled with uh, fibrosis. 
And it actually is very reminiscent in my mind to cystic fibrosis. And patients with cystic fibrosis uh, are actually treated nowadays with azithromycin because it prevents the production of IL-6 probably through a senolytic action. And it's well documented that it reduces serum levels of IL-6, but also it prevents fibrosis. And nobody understood the mechanism there. But if you look back with uh, senescence colored glasses, you realize that uh, those patients normally die from fibrosis. But uh, the azithromycin prevents the onset of fibrosis. And uh, that's because you have myofibroblasts in the lungs that develop and generate the fibrosis, but those cells are also considered to be senescent cells. So you're actually removing the myofibroblast. So with one drug, you would inhibit inflammation, you would remove senescent cells, and you would prevent the onset of fibrosis, none of which is considered to be an antibiotic effect. So if you use the analogy that uh, this COVID-19 infection is a very acute uh, form of cystic fibrosis, you might actually be able to save a lot of people. And, uh, and there's already clinical evidence to suggest that it reduces viral titers to zero. Although this was only six patients, I think it would be a good idea to expand the clinical trial and also test other senolytic agents uh, in parallel that are also FDA approved drugs. Again, this would cost very little because these drugs are mostly off patent and widely available and considered to be uh, safe. So while, while we're waiting for new drugs or vaccines that could take anywhere between two years and typically it takes about 15 years to develop a new drug, uh, we would want to find something that was quick and easy that's off the shelf that we could use uh, to prevent uh, or also uh, treat patients with this uh, terrible uh, disease that's now plaguing us. Um, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, how do you feel that the anti-inflammatory action of azithromycin, and I just want to say, I, I looked up some of your references on azithromycin, and it was fascinating because this anti-inflammatory effect has been known for a little while, um, and it, it's very very striking how, how strong it is in, in some of the studies. Um, do you, it, is the anti-inflammatory action of azithromycin, do you feel that it's related to its antiviral action? And if so, or, or if not, how does the SASP relate to the, the, the pathogenicity of the virus and what is happening with patients? Right. So I think it all comes down to protein synthesis. So viruses don't have their own machinery. So when they infect cells, they need to use the cellular machinery to replicate themselves. So they take over and they convert all the host machinery into a factory for the virus. That involves a ton of protein synthesis. So azithromycin, a little known side effect of azithromycin, that is related to its antibiotic activity is that it inhibits uh, protein synthesis. It's a protein synthesis inhibitor in bacteria, but because there are similarities between the ribosomes in bacteria and ribosomes in mammalian cells, uh, it's not perfect. It doesn't only target bacteria, but also has host side effects. So we could capitalize on those host side effects and uh, turn it around and turn that into a therapeutic effect. And so it may be also that uh, there's a contribution through the inhibition of protein synthesis. That would also inhibit cytokine production uh, as well. So you would reduce inflammation by inhibiting protein synthesis, 
you would also reduce viral replication. There are published papers showing that azithromycin inhibits viral replication of Zika virus, of Ebola virus, and there are other drugs like rapamycin, for example, that is uh, an inhibitor of mTOR. It's an inhibitor of protein synthesis as well, and people showed uh, that it actually in inhibits uh, HIV replication. So the idea of uh, using an inhibitor of protein synthesis is also very attractive for two reasons. One, to inhibit viral replication, and the other, because of the anti-inflammatory effect to shut off cytokine production. So all of that ties into uh, this as well, and both azithromycin and, and rapamycin are considered to be anti-aging uh, drugs. So it all, all so, sort of fits together. Absolutely. Um, so the, the inhibition of, uh, so senescent cells are, um, have a higher rate of, of manufacturing proteins. They're, they're putting out their, their senescence associated secretory phenotype, all these inflammatory cytokines and so on. And then they have uh, the, these markers, CD26 and ACE2. Um, so in essence, then, this, the, the, the idea is that the virus infects senescent cells preferentially or more so than other cells because they have these excess markers. And also, the senescent cells are cranking out the proteins uh, the inflammatory cytokines and so on, and that is what's going on. Is that a is that a good way of looking at it? Yeah, that's a perfect summation. And and the other advantage to the virus is that uh, these cells that are senescent already have their protein synthesis machinery already revved up. So the virus comes in there, and then it can take over immediately. And these cells are already factories for the production of cytokines. It can just switch over. To viral replication. So the virus in the end is very smart because it chose a cell that is specialized for massive protein synthesis. That is absolutely fascinating um, and, it, and it makes so much sense. Um, so we just need to shut down the inflammation and shut down the viral replication. And the best way to do that is with an inhibitor of protein synthesis. Whether or not the drug was actually approved for that purpose doesn't really matter. All that really matters is the functional effect. Absolutely. Um, I was, um, when back, back uh, many, many years ago, I worked, at, I lived and worked in West Africa and I took chloroquine once a week as a malarial prophylactic. And that got me to thinking, hmm. So one of the prerequisites, um, I, I suppose you'd say, of using something as a prophylactic seems to be uh, a relatively long incubation time. So malaria obviously has this, uh, you, you know, it, it, it is an, an immediate infection. It takes time to develop in the body and so on. You take chloroquine once a week, it gets rid of it, and you, you repeat ad infinitum. And then I got to thinking, um, well, from what I'm reading this, the virus has an incubation time before symptoms of perhaps a couple of weeks. And then I thought, well, maybe, maybe prophylaxis is possible um, by taking chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, or maybe, I don't know, maybe even with azithromycin. What do you think about that? Does that make any sense? Well, I think the issue is that these are FDA approved drugs, so they require prescriptions. So sure. you need to get a clearance from your doctor before taking anything prophylactically. But uh, many people don't really know the history of, of chloroquine. Uh, actually, uh, I think it was originally discovered that quinine was uh, the parent compound and and had the anti-malarial effect. And so uh, there's something called tonic water. So you can actually buy tonic water and 
it may, I mean, I don't know in this case if it has any effect if it's high enough dose. But Sadly, I've actually, discovered that modern tonic water doesn't have enough quinine in it. Other, <laughs> yeah, right. So I, I don't know about the old days of, uh, you know, they, they must have dosed a lot of quinine in it. Exactly. So I think the best thing to do would be to set up clinical trials to, to test this hypothesis. And, you know, since there are so many patients that are affected uh, and these drugs are already FDA approved, uh, it shouldn't be uh, difficult because they've already passed uh, phase one, so they're considered to be safe. So you could immediately move them into phase two, which would be this type of uh, trial that uh, we're suggesting. You, know, you don't have to do azithromycin, you can do many other recent uh, drugs that have been identified as, uh, F as uh, senolytics. There are others, like digoxin, for example, was identified as a senolytic. That's a well-known, very old heart drug and also considered very safe. So I think, you know, all these things are on the table. We should take advantage of them. Time is of the essence. We need to, we need to prevent this lethality, which is so urgent. Yes, definitely. Um, when... Re referring back to one of your papers that you wrote um, a, a couple of years ago where you you uh, announced, if that's the right word, um, that azithromycin was a senolytic at relatively low doses and that it was highly s specific um, because, for example, the closely related antibiotic erythromycin was, had no action as a senolytic. Um, I was interested in you. You screened a number of compounds in in that study. Um, why did you choose those particular compounds? I, I looked up the supplemental material for your. Uh, there, there was a list of maybe a dozen compounds in there that you screened, and you got that hit on azithromycin and the one other antibiotic. Um, why did you choose those particular compounds to screen? Well, it was more historical uh, from our point of view because we were also working on cancer and we were wondering uh, how we could inhibit the cancer stem cells. And we found that it was an antibiotic that was the most attractive because of the evolutionary relationship with mitochondria. So a long time ago, about 1.5 billion years ago, bacteria snuck into cells and they became mitochondria over one and a half billion years of evolution. So a lot of antibiotics have a mitochondrial uh, side effect. And uh, so we found that cancer stem cells are actually dependent on uh, mitochondria for their propagation. So we wanted to inhibit the cancer stem cells which cause recurrence, metastasis, and drug resistance and ultimately kill uh, prematurely many, many cancer patients. In fact, most cancer patients actually die from metastasis, which is driven by the cancer stem cells. So we were thinking that maybe there's a link here because we and others believe that cancer stem cells and cancer cells actually originate from senescent cells. So senescent cells are thought to be locked into a state of cell cycle arrest. But then we think that they break out of that cell cycle arrest through one of many different mechanisms and they become uh, cancer stem cells. So we thought there would be a link there. So we decided to go back to the well and see if antibiotics such as doxycycline and azithromycin, which worked on the cancer stem cells, would also work on the senescent cells. And we were very surprised that uh, although doxycycline didn't have an effect, azithromycin did, and it was highly selective. And it wasn't killing the normal uh, cells, just the 
senescent cells. So it appeared to be very selective, which is unique because we tested some other drugs that are thought to have senolytic activity, but they didn't show the same selectivity. Uh, for example, quercetin uh, by itself or in combination with the satinib didn't show the same selectivity as azithromycin. And here we had a drug that was thought to be very safe, and it was only a single drug, and it was FDA approved. So we thought that this could be something that could be very well uh, used and studied by the community. So uh, yes, I was very interested to see your your, your results for dasatinib and, and quercetin. Um, so I, I'm guessing from your results that azithromycin could conceivably be much more effective than, than either of those based on your findings. Would you say that? Right. The, ne the next step would be to do clinical trials, and we're in the process of, uh, you know, getting those together. We've started those discussions, so that'll be something that's on the drawing board for the not-too-distant future. So we're excited about that. Absolutely. It is very exciting. Do, do, you, do you see anything uh, a priori uh, right now that that might hinder um, results, cell culture results uh, 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 to, you know, in vivo or human, human results? Or is it just a matter of you got to try it? I think we have to try it. There's good evidence in patients with cystic fibrosis that it is efficacious and in terms of extending their lifespan and also preventing the fibrosis. And another key process that is activated during uh, aging and senescence is fibrosis. So we think that the work on patients with cystic fibrosis sort of gives us a very positive uh, perspective that it's likely to work. It's just a question for us to uh, put the trials into play and uh, and get them approved ethically before we proceed, as you would with any phase two clinical trial. But because the drug is considered to be safe and also we have, you know, ideas about dosing uh, and toxicity based on uh, the studies, such as the cystic fibrosis patient studies, which are many. Uh, it, all the pharmacokinetics is very well established. So it, it would make doing a trial relatively straightforward. Um. I, I and, and many others are, uh, are fascinated by the uh, process of autophagy um, and how it relates to aging. Um, in, indeed, there's a, there's a paper uh, out there that, that talks about the essential requirement of autophagy for life extension. Um, and I noticed that uh, in your paper that, uh, and also let me say, so one, one reason it's so fascinating is that many uh, healthful practices upregulate the process of autophagy, for example, exercise or fasting. Um, I noticed that uh, in your paper, azithromycin stimulates autophagy in the senescent cells, and, and that seems to be a key component of what's going on. Could you discuss that a little bit? Uh, how do, what is the relationship there? Yeah, so I, I think it's very interesting, the connection between autophagy and senescence. People think of autophagy and senescence as two very separate processes, but I think they're linked and, and autophagy uh, often starts first. And so the cell begins to accumulate lysosomes and autophagosomes, uh, but there is a direct connection between autophagy and senescence. It's almost more accurate to think of them as a continuum, 
So let's say, for example, you're in autophagic cell and something goes wrong and you're under stress. That can lead to leaky lysosomes and those lysosomes will leak out cathepsins and the cathepsins have been shown to cleave the sirtuins. So, and also other people have shown that autophagy is just a step on the way to senescence. So you could think of senescence almost like a late stage of autophagy, or you could think of autophagy as an early stage of senescence. And so one idea is that azithromycin induces autophagy in senescent cells, and that may be enough to kill them, may push them back into apoptosis. So that, that might give us a, a more broader perspective on drugs that might uh, act as senolytics. Again, we don't know exactly what is the target of azithromycin in senescent cells, but uh, that gives us at least a starting point. And I think it should allow us to discover other uh, drugs that are senolytics. And the other one you, you were alluding to is uh, roxithromycin, which is a close relative of azithromycin, but still very distinct. And the interesting thing is that it's being developed for hair restoration, for male pattern baldness. And uh, one way to think about that is that maybe it's re removing the senescent cells in the scalp. And so then allowing the stem cells, the hair stem cells to regenerate hair follicles. So there may be a benefit to removing the senescent cells to allow the normal stem cells to then uh, regenerate the body. Interesting, I see. Um, would you, um, the, would you care to, to, I don't know if this is, if this would be hazard a guess, or maybe you could, maybe you could say more precisely, but um, as we age, um, we uh, obviously have physical changes. That's what aging is. Um, and um, what, what fraction of that or, or yeah, what fraction of that would you attribute to cellular senescence? Or are there other things going on that are as or more important? If, in other words, if we could, if we could get rid of senescent cells, then, um, um, if we could get rid of senescent cells, um, are we going to reverse aging? It se seems to be the case in some of the uh, uh, mice experiments that have been done. They saw uh, a, a reversal of aging. Would you speak to that? Well, I think it's a complicated issue, but the data speaks for itself that there's a, a huge uh, benefit from removing uh, senescent cells. So originally the experiments were done in mice and they used a genetic trick. So they were able to tag the senescent cells with the promoter by looking at the expression of the promoter of INC4A or P16. And then they were able to cause those senescent cells to undergo uh, apoptosis. But this is all a, a genetic trick in mice. And they saw that removal of the senescent cells could uh, be tremendously beneficial for uh, minimizing the effects of aging associated diseases, but also potentially reversing them. So the question is, I guess that's why the search for senolytic drugs is so, so much of a focus nowadays, because if you were, so you can't do genetics in humans, but you can do pharmacology. So if you had a senolytic drug that did the same thing uh, as was done in those mouse experiments, you could give that drug once, but you could actually give it multiple times over long periods intermittently. And then you could periodically prune 
the body of senescent cells. And each time you did that, you would potentially be uh, allowing the body to regenerate and restore its normal function. So you could potentially increase lifespan, but more importantly, you could increase uh, health span, which is the healthy years of life. So making life much more uh, productive and fruitful without all the aging associated diseases. So we could eliminate the aging associated diseases by potentially eliminating the senescent cells. Um, very good. You you mentioned it, um, in your most recent paper, and you you mentioned it here as well. Um, rapamycin. Um, Mikhail Blagoskloni has written several papers, or at least a couple of papers, concerning the link between rapamycin and gero conversion in, into senescence. Um, do you see that as a viable, do you see rapamycin as a viable strategy for um, preventing the emergence of senescent cells? And while I'm, while I'm on that um, topic, could you, again, you, you mentioned rapamycin in connection with protein synthesis in viral infection. So I, I've got two points there for you. Um, what, what is rapamycin in geroconversion and the other in viral infection? Yeah, sure. So the first part, uh, rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor, so it inhibits uh, protein synthesis. Protein synthesis is required for viral replication, so it would be expected to shut down viral replication. It's already been published for HIV that it will actually prevent replication of the HIV virus. So there's data directly to show that it has antiviral properties. In addition, uh, Blagastoni has shown that, uh, as you alluded to, that it prevents juror conversion. I guess what he means by that is that uh, experiments that he showed you could put cells into cell cycle arrest. And normally that cell cycle arrest would eventually become uh, senescence. But if those cells were then incubated in the presence of rapamycin, and then the cells were released from cell cycle arrest, they could proliferate again. So what that shows is that rapamycin actually prevents the onset of senescence. So that could be also very beneficial because, you know, if you think about that, that also takes care of the problem. So you can prevent the onset of senescence, or you can also remove the senescent cells with a senolytic. So those two approaches are complementary, but they really achieve the same goal, which is to reduce the SASP and prevent the inflammation associated with aging that causes all, all the damage. Um, what do you what do you think regarding um, senescent cells? Uh, the, the question before that, I asked you about what uh, fraction of the aging phenotype you had to do with senescent cells, in your opinion. And then, so what I would like to ask now is, um, do we have any idea? Do, do we, meaning science uh, in general, um, have any idea of how fast senescent cells accumulate in humans at, and at how many of them we have at, at certain ages it, with, with the end goal of, or the end question of at what age or at what point would it be useful to uh, start uh, eliminating senescent cells? I guess the general consensus is that they begin to accumulate as you age, but uh, there's a critical point in your 40s and 50s where they start to accumulate. Uh, and most people uh, talk about feeling aches and pains and back pain. And that's, you know, one of the most common symptoms that brings people to the doctor is back pain. 
So that back pain you begin to feel in your, and the stiffness that you begin to feel in your 40s and 50s is really that sign, I think, of the critical accumulation of, of senescent cells. It's also when the incidence of cancer begins to increase. <clears throat> so I think there's a relationship there. Again, uh, with cancer, we think that the uh, senescent cells are the precursors. So the more senescent cells you have, the more chance you have for them to become uh, cancer cells. So if you were to remove them, then you would potentially also reduce your risk of getting cancer. So removing senescent cells or preventing <coughs> senescent cells, both would be beneficial. Um, so, circling back around to um, our our original topic of uh, COVID nineteen, um, then what what would you like to see? <clears throat> what would what would you like to see um, happen as far as uh, clinical trials? Um, do you believe that these could be um, going quickly? Do you, do you think that um, these drugs such as azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine would be um, just widely available soon to, to treat COVID-19? How, how do you see that? Well, I guess that's a question of uh, the governments and authorities to decide how they want to move this forward. You know, we can only provide ideas and we don't actually work on the virus. So all we're providing is a, a new way of thinking, a new framework to visualize the potential of clinical trials. And already there's an existing clinical trial. So I think the evidence is already there for benefit. It's just a question of repeating that and doing azithromycin alone, and also extending it to other uh, drugs that are senolytics. We don't want to put all our eggs in one basket, obviously. Right. And take advantage of the fact that these drugs are FDA approved and safe. And again, we have nothing to lose because the longer we wait, the more people uh, will, will die. Right. It's a kind of uh, against time. And various, various governments have admitted that, you know, obviously there aren't enough respirators to go around. And so we need to do something now. I mean, one idea is to make more respirators, but you can also do clinical trials. Right. Absolutely. Um, with, like, as you say, with there being uh, FDA approved drugs already with uh, good track records and safety records, um, that seems that seems to me that trials could begin pretty quickly. Um, well, okay. Well, well, um, I would like to uh, end with uh, asking you. Um, you, where your research is taking you now. Uh, will you continue to work on cellular senescence? Do you have any um, other, other, other big projects in the pipeline? Well, we have three areas of concentration in the lab. One is the discovery of drugs that will target cancer stem cells. The other is the identification of drugs that will target senescent cells. But we also have an interest in antibiotic resistance. And so we're also working on drugs that would target uh, MRSA, the methicillin resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus. And then that would give us additional antibiotics to fight against uh, antibiotic resistance. And so that's another focus. And we actually use. Uh, Again, the relationship between mitochondria and bacteria to look at that because we thought that 
we could use uh, cancer cells actually for screening to identify mitochondrial inhibitors. And then those mitochondrial inhibitors would actually be antibiotics. And we've done those studies and it works. So we've developed a systematic way to make antibiotics uh, and, and that should give us uh, a blueprint for fighting antibiotic resistance. Very interesting. Um, I, I want to thank you, Dr. Lasanti, for um, agreeing to interview with me, taking the time here. Um, your very interesting paper um, is to be published soon, I understand, uh, on uh, the one we were discussing on, on uh, senescent cells and, and uh, COVID-19. Um, so thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. It was very good talking to you. Cheers. Bye Thank now. Thank you. Bye.